Hello, good afternoon. You're welcome to Agenda on TV3. My name is Deborah Kwabla. Today we are looking at a preview of the 2018 budget. Uh, we know the budget will be read on the 15th of November 2017. And the Minister of Finance has already hinted that government intends to streamline its economic policy for 2018 also focus on education and health and also evolve an agriculture marshall plan what does that entail we will do a preview of the discussion we'll go for a break when we come back i introduce our guest and we'll get into the discussion we'll be back shortly Copy. Oh. No, it's okay. Then let
You are welcome back. This is Agenda on TV3. We are looking at the 2018 budget review. With me in the studio to do this discussion from far left, we have Mr. Edward Kariwe. He's a General Secretary of Agriculture Workers Union. In the middle, we have Professor Kletos Dudonu. He's an economist and the CEO of Claydot Consult. On my immediate left, we have Dr. Magnus Abu Duncan. He's an economist at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Welcome, gentlemen, to Agenda. We we'll start you. with you, Doc. The 2017 budget. Let's do a little uh, preview, uh, review of the 2017 budget. In your view, has government uh, performed creditably or satisfactorily in relation to the macroeconomic indicators? Okay, looking at the macroeconomic indicators, um, judging by the half year uh, figures, <laughs> you see that for the macroeconomic indicators, much has been achieved. For instance, let's look at GDP. If you compare half year, 2017 with half year, 2016, you have a growth of 7.8. <coughs> and, and that includes oil. And oil increased by, I think, 105% over that of first year, 2016. But if you take non-oil growth, that one is 4%, and government has targeted 4.6. So <coughs> since this is half year, we can say it will be, uh, I mean, it will be achieved on them. But looking at 7.8 overall, and government targeting 6.3%, I think um, there is some indication that that uh, macroeconomic target can be achieved. Let's look at inflation. Government is targeting end year inflation of 11.2. Um, the October inflation 11.6. So, which means <coughs> it's getting closer. And let's look again at um, average inflation for the year. Government is targeting 12.4. And if you look at the average inflation from January to October, it's 12.5, <coughs> which is almost achieved. And looking at um, our reserves, the number of months of import, if you take uh, import cover, if you take the first half of the year, it's 4.1 percent, a 4.1 months, mm -hmm. which is above government target of three months for the whole year. Where we have problems is the revenue and then expenditure targets. That's our way off. Mm -hmm. And if you take um, tax revenue, for instance, it's a, a huge drop of about 75% <coughs> of the target for the total revenue, you see? So when it comes to revenue, you see that government performance has been very poor. Domestic revenue, mm. yeah, the taxes are not coming. Coming, Prof, we, we need the revenue to come in to <coughs> deal with a lot of the bold initiatives that government uh, initiated uh, this year. Um, do you feel that the tax, uh, the reduction in tax and the exemptions were overly ambitious because some say that that is an area that needs to be watched? Well, you know, normally when we talk about revenue, uh, our mind jumps to tax Taxes. revenue. And we saw an array of taxes over the previous years which were building up up to the point that financial sector also has VAT on transactions and incomes. But you can see a big break with the past where most of the taxes have been demolished uh, termed the nuisance taxes. So it will take some time for the system to pick up. Normally when tax policies are put in place they are linked, there are two types of taxes generally the ad valorem and then the specific where here and there because of certain objectives, a fixed tax is put. It will take some time. First, these taxes, they have to go through the system, 
And when the budget came, the budget, uh, the, the parliament has to uh, legitimize this by their oversight responsibility. So it takes time to sink in. And if, for instance, GDP, we are doing fairly all right, but we expect to put in more effort, then it means by the ad valorem, the taxes will not be coming as fast as we want. Let businesses pick then. So I don't think it's, we are over ambitious. It's a lot of, uh, shall I call it, change happening. <laughs> like TV3, you are undertaking a corporate restructuring now. During that time, it will be unfair that certain expectations can ride above. They may just be around the target or even maybe below. But let the changes come. Let everybody settle. Let's chatter the course. You're right. So I don't Prof. think it's too much ambition. It's not too much ambi ambitious, as you have said. But then how do we rake in the revenue? Because uh, clearly, government is doing below target. And it's this revenue is needed to deal with a lot of the issues that are currently ongoing. It, it, and I agree with you. It is very important that we find ways of raking in target. Much of the revenue also comes from different sources. And one of the hurdles in the way is an array of exemptions. I think you are aware that discussions about the exemptions and reconsideration of which ones to uh, continue and which ones to um, keep, that debate is still on. So it took, it, would, it would take a lot of uh, time, not very many years or whatever, for things to settle in. I believe that some of the assumptions, which is around about 2.5% of the GDP, just exemptions alone, our overall tax is around 20, 21, 22% of the GDP. So if you see the exemptions alone, if we're able to solve those problems, I think we should be able to come to speed. Is that, is that, yes, you want uh, to react Prof. briefly in the now? <coughs> I think um, because of all this, that's why the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the post-budget 2017, we said that um, the <laughs> revenue targets are overly ambitious mm. because with this restructuring, which Prof. rightly said that it will take time for <coughs> the gains to come in, then we expected that the revenue, I mean, increases over the 2016 one shouldn't be so much, about 30 so something it percent. It's a matter of trying to match the <coughs> revenue with the expenditure because, of course, we know we had free SHS and a few other things that we're going to implement. So yes. isn't the match very important because then you need to match your revenue it, with your expenditure budgets. Yes. So that one, that is what the government is doing. But what I'm saying is that the revenue targets that were set and with this tax policy, the adjustments and others, which we all agree that looking at why these taxes, why the, um, the government tried to review these taxes and others to let um, producers expand. Mm. And the expansion cannot take place all of a sudden. It has to take time, as Prof said. So next year and then the next, you see that these tax revenues are coming. We'll, we'll but for it. the 2017 budget, um, we think that it was overly ambitious because if you are withdrawing these taxes, it takes time as Prof said, for those things to pick up in the economy. Yeah. Mr. Karaway, we are looking at the macro indicators and they are <coughs> looking good. How about the micro? Because that's really what people feel in their pockets. Well, the one who may think that it is the micro that sometimes leads to the macro, but the other way around could be the case where when the macro indicators are right, 
then it trickles down to change the micro uh, situation. Now, it would take time for the effect to be realized on the micro if we start to reform the system from the macro level. Now, when you talk about inflation comes down or targets are met, that may not immediately necessarily trans translate to the macro level. That will not immediately make people feel it in their expenditure. But if it is sustainable over a period, the aggregate effect will now impact heavily on the micro, on the individual. Now, so the restructuring of the economy through the usage of the taxes and so on, we have to be clear about the effects of those taxes, short-term effect and long-term effect. Now, the budget indicators are meant for short term. Within one year, Another budget I am going to achieve so much. So when you give a target and the target is not met, you need to uh, understand why those targets are not met so that you don't repeat the, the consequences in the subsequent uh, uh, years. So, well, but everything revolves around revenue. So if your revenue targets are low, are not met, then that is a serious area of concern to look at what is it that uh, we have done or we have not done for us to fall short of the, the target. It could be that, yes, you have done well, but except that you were over ambitious. You know, it could be from that uh, uh, concern. It could also be that, yes, you are not over ambitious, but something that you needed to have done, you did not do it well. So in your subsequent budget, if you do those things well, then you can correct it. So this is uh, how I uh, look at it. So it has so short-term effect yeah. and then the long-term effect. Yeah. Pro Prof, the, the, we've talked many years around uh, widening the tax net and bringing all the people into the net so that we can increase at least tax revenue. Do you feel that the 2017 budget and implementation so far has given the indication that we are widening the net? Definitely. Definitely. Even the modest uh, revenue achieved, to me, with the huge amount of demolitions around loss of about one billion Ghana cities. If you recalibrate it into our normal targets, you see that even then it's coming up. But uh, he has said something which is very interesting. You know, when we are talking about ad valorem taxation and uh, we are talking about income tax and so on and so forth, it takes some time. This economy had been a consumption economy for a very long time. We import everything, in quote. Now that we are into a paradigm shift into trying to restructure the economy, the gears will take place. You know, some of the programs like uh, Zungo, um, development. Uh, development programs, you have to go through the legislative and so on and so forth. Parliament again has to give its accent before you now operationalize it and then you kick off. So there will be delays here and there in the flow of income and if, if we say a, a, a a, a project, a policy, is over ambitious. It has a certain meaning, as though even inherently it is unachievable. But when you look at the trend of things, it's taking longer time for certain things to settle in. 
it's taking a little bit of time for interest rate to go down as we expect. You can see that even the policy rate of the central bank uh, monetary committee is also going down. It's taking time. So I don't want, that's why I'm avoiding the word um, over ambitious. Mm. Yes, ambitious. Yes, of course. Especially when you expect. And you, ha you heard the president say that uh, we are in a hurry. Mm. So s when you are doing targeting, ex ante, you are making some very serious assumptions, serious expectations, and so on and so forth. But, but those must be achievable uh, expectations. No, I'm talking uh, about the over ambition and ambition. I want to be ambitious. Mm. But I don't want to be over ambitious. I must be ambitious within realities. There are ups and downs. There are plus five, plus, uh, minus five in our targeting. We have errors. We make mistakes. And in your view, was government ambitious or over ambitious? Oh, in, in if you say government is ambitious, that one I'm very comfortable with it. But, but not, the over, moment, not overly ambitious. Yes, uh, uh, over ambitious. First and foremost, it is right for. TV3 to be very ambitious, trying to put things together, reform, restructure, to meet the current frontline adverts, strategies, shoes, music, and so on. So I will never blame uh, TV3. I will never blame any country. You know, in 1965, when Singapore pulled out of uh, Malaysia, they were a, a, a state. And then the British loved them. Lee Kuan Yew was overwhelmed. What the hell is going on? But you know what trick he did? He created jobs for the girls and boys. He, the private sector was and encouraged. And that, that, that's one, one area that, as a country, we constantly have talked about creating jobs uh, for the youth. And we have started we have now. A team Zongo youth willing to work, and there's no work for it, them. That's right. We reach 48%. That also would take some time to open up. Mm. We have a lot of difficulties in our country. Investors face, face a whole lot of difficulties in this country. Because uh, the system hasn't changed much. Uh, Doc, we are trying <coughs> to change a lot of things. Um, mm. But the system, the system yes. that we operate in this country, doing yes. business, cost of business, and all these things haven't changed much. Yeah. <coughs> um, government is trying to change some of these things. And if you talk about the structure of the economy, itself haven't uh, changed much. Now, the services sector is the, is the <coughs> sector that is leading GDP. And there hasn't been proper linkages between the services sector, agriculture, and then industry. That's where the problem is. And if industry, because the economy leapfrogged from agriculture to services without industrialization. So the growth of the services sector, the consumption, the, most of them are imported. You see, most of them are imported. So if you cannot produce these things yourself, now we have this <coughs> communication, mobile phones, this, do we manufacture them here? At least we should be adding value by even assembling mm -hmm. them. You see, there are a whole lot of these things, uh, this modernization, which we import the gadgets that are being used to do because we left industrialization behind, move from agri straight to services. And I think that's the more reason why the government is trying to bring in this one district, one factory, and, <coughs> and, and so on and, and so things. forth to try and then fix these things. And that is why we also have this <coughs> unemployment problem. Mm. Okay. Let's look at the education sector. Mm. We have a lot of private universities now. But look at the courses <coughs> of, 
oh, banking, finance, the and then, yes, the humanities, and then, and those things straight away, it means that you have to go to the services sector mm. to work. You see, and now that there has been a lot of automations there, banking and finance, so private investors, almost all of them are doing banking and finance. At the time that we are using ATMs and internet banking, and so if you produce these people, where do you want them to go to work? You see, so we have to reorient our education curriculum, start from basic level, so that we <coughs> transfer knowledge that makes people and uh, be self-employed or, or be entrepreneurs themselves rather than uh, being salaried, salaried workers. So this one of the areas, the linkages <coughs> between services, agri and then industry is very poor. Mm -hmm. Unless that thing is broken, the unemployment problem will oh, continue. Yeah. Let's go to Mr. Kairo. 20, in 2017, <coughs> we know the agricultural sector suffered uh, a huge um, issue with the uh, fall armyworm and all that. In your view, is this um, going to affect the indicators that were set for 2017? Well, <coughs> let me indicate that the agricultural sector is a huge sector. Uh, with many subsectors. Mm. Uh, it is true that uh, the crop subsector plays uh, a, a significant uh, part of the whole agricultural sector. Now, the planting for food and jobs is also just a subset of the subsector, uh, uh, sub the crop subsector. Crop, crop sub sub mm. Now, that means that only five crops are uh, involved. And then the fall armyworm indeed affected mainly the maize. So if there's going to be a setback, then it will be in the... But what are the indications? What, what, how is it looking like? Well, uh, some of the farms were, were able to recover. Farmers, I mean, they recovered depending on the level of uh, uh, destruction. Some were heavily... Uh, destroyed that such that they could not recover. Now the other thing too is that the the second uh, season means they they also suffered much, but the first one got recovered, mm -hmm. but the second one had a challenge. So it depends on the <coughs> we we have to wait for the aggregate to see uh, and see how that will turn out, but. Certainly, we will not be hitting the target that we had uh, given ourselves. But the overall could still, uh, the effect may not be so much on agriculture uh, because it is only uh, five crops and it is only one crop that is mainly affected by the. Uh, the fall army worm. Mm. But, but, but without that, we could end up, we could have ended up with a bumper harvest and that could have brought down the cost of maize. And of course, this then will affect the micro. A lot of people eat maize and it, people will feel it in their pocket. And so irrespective of how the aggregates end up, isn't it important that what happened still would have uh, dented the, the, the achievement of those targets a little bit? Well, the bumper harvest, if you look at prices in the market now, uh, prices are going up, particularly the non northern part of the country because of they got hit uh, not only the, uh, by the fall armyworm but also by a drought within three weeks. You know, when they, they needed rains for the maize and cereals and others to um, tassel, then the rain did not come. Now, all that put together affected the, uh, uh, will affect the uh, output, but I'm only saying that I'm su I suspect that we will have a little less than what we would have had. But as to whether that will will lead will affect a bumper harvest, when you talk about a bumper harvest, here, it's just quite uh, a short term. During harvest, we often get bumper harvest during harvesting period which could be within one month or so, you get bumper harvest. Beyond that, there's no bumper harvest. 
in the sense that they would have, farmers would have gone to throw out their produce in the market at a very low price. And then after that, they have nothing to sell again. Then prices shoot up, you see. So the pomba harvest will always come. But it will come, whether it will be prolonged, it will be severe or short term, will depend on a number of factors. And um, it will also depend on whether farmers can store uh, the produce. And, you know, when they change the trajectory, I don't know what this uh, school feeding program uh, and then the, this free uh, SHS, the linkage is. If the linkage is strong, whereby they could immediately, you know, go to the farms to pick the food stuffs for the free SHS, then of course you would you can expect the 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 so-called bumper harvest to uh, reduce to minimize. But if there's no that linkage is not good, then of course the bumper harvest will be severe. And when it is severe, it's with ag agricultural produce, even the consumer does not, uh, you know, get much. For instance, uh, when the price of tomatoes goes down, <laughs> you just, though you can't buy m much of it and store, you know, so you still buy just a little more than what you would have bought, and then leave the rest. So you have double effect, which is negative. The consumer does not benefit more. The producer, too, does not benefit. But it has a long-term effect on both of them, which is, again, negative, to the extent that the producer will reduce production in subsequent uh, uh, farming season. And then that will also now turn out to have low, low production low, low. and it will, again, affect it, it the isn't consumer. Isn't that because we do not have industries to, to produce them? But you, you yeah. could hold that for me. We'll go for a break. When we come back, we'll look at the preview of the 2018 budget. I would ask our guests to, to give us some uh, insights. What are the main pillars uh, that we should be expecting in the 2018 budget? We'll go for a break and we'll come back shortly and continue the discussion. We'll be right back.
You're welcome back. This is still Agenda on TV3. We are looking at the 2018 budget preview. We'll start with you, Doug. The 2018 budget, what are the main pillars you are expecting? <coughs> um, the main pillars, according to what the finance minister said, and then also some of the programs they've started launching, like the <coughs> Agriculture Marshall Plan, and then I think that education to look at education also and then you have also this industrialization especially this one district one factory and I think those are the main pillars there and <coughs> government has also initiated some programs which is expected to boost revenue domestic revenue like this paperless um, um, transactions at the ports um like this uh, using technology in i mean this tax administration and others and this um gonna put gps and they are bringing all this in in order to help <coughs> collect more taxes and that one we are also talking about widening the tax net at the um, informal sector level where I expect um, revenues to come from, especially for the local <coughs> government setup, will be property rates. Mm. Yeah, I that, think that's, it's that's where the <coughs> MMDs have not done it's, yeah, too, it's, too well. It's very, it's very important that you collect the property rate, make sure those living there see what that money is being it's used for their roots yeah so that one if it's given to the local government sector to do it and then account it properly in the end to control accountant general to i mean as part of the taxes you know some of these taxes but that are, that are local collected government already in charge <coughs> the mmbas are supposed to be collecting property they, taxes. they they don't they are not doing much when i was staying at Ashari, which we, i left there to 2015 five bedroom house with um, a study room a very big compound the property rate was 50 cities a year <laughs> a year and if you collect this rate what can you do so if they're able to collect this rates and others i think pressure on the central government to be doing a lot of things at the local government level well yeah. you see so most of this uh, main things should be <coughs> channeled through the uh, local government level to also do their part. Otherwise, the central government cannot be collecting all the taxes for us. It will be very expensive. Mm. I'm, um, <coughs> I'm surprised you are talking about channeling it through the local um, level they already are in charge. The districts are supposed to collect the local taxes they are supposed to do. We know recently AMA uh, did re-evaluation of uh, some of the indicators that they used to calculate their property rates and how, things like that. So, many, so shouldn't the local many, government uh, authorities many, be more proactive in collecting local taxes? How many of the districts have that capacity to do it? Mm. You see? So if they strengthen the capacity of the different district assemblies, they can do it. You go to some of the assemblies and they don't have the requisite amount of staff to make it a full assembly, you see? So if they will be allowed to employ experts and others who will be doing this valuation and then others for them, that is it. But, but, but Prof, why do <coughs> the tax nets and empowering the local authorities to collect uh, the revenue that we so dearly need as a country. What else should we do to the MMDAs? Because they, they already have the backing, the support to collect. Well, uh, personally, I think uh, over the years, we have not really uh, achieved uh, fiscal decentralization. Um, and by this, I mean effective fiscal dis decentralization. Um, some of the intentions are very clear. So 
if, if we are talking about taxes, we are talking about different levels of taxes. Mm -hmm. So the um, MMDAs, they really have a lot of challenge. The first one is what he is talking about as the capacity. And then also we expect them to be given initial, or shall I say, real, effective authority. We have, it's like at the national level, if we really empower the MMDAs, then we'll look fiscal authority. We will lose our authority over finances. The we meaning central government? Central government. <laughs> it has always been the <coughs> case. And it, it, it's worse in some countries, actually. But Ghana is no exception. So, so typically in the, in the budget uh, year such as this, we, we have the budget, uh, the Minister of Finance reading the budget in three days on Wednesday. Is there anything we should expect that we'll start looking at? Uh, MMDAs and tax collection and all. Are you expecting anything like that? I do, especially for the internal uh, IGF, internally generated fund. I, I do expect that we should give more authority. And normally when we say authority in public administrative settings, we are talking about capacity. Capacity to effectively address the issues, understand the local difficulties. No, I'm not surprised that a big building like that, but maybe the location can be the reason why the rate is so low on that property. But it could also be, has the property, uh, what we call property, land property, uh, uh, ownership authority. We have some government buildings, we even have some private buildings you cannot say this is the owner of this property. At Redco. <laughs> I joined Redco a long, long time ago. I still have my house. I can use my own property as a basis of enhancing my credibility in the bank to obtain extra loans. And then you're going to charge me that I have a property when I don't even have any title to but, but if the, the property, property rate is worth 50 <coughs> cities, then it, it tells you the worth of that property generally. And so no, that, that cannot do be they, Do they have the capacity of evaluation? That, 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 that's, uh, that's another you problem. See, when, when I say to authorize an MMDA to actually go out there, that capacity building uh, Dr. Bob Duncan is referring to, comes to the fore. They must learn how to appraise. They must be sure that the people who are in that are either the owners or the owners are elsewhere. There is title. In Ghana, when it is title time, then it's like uh, playing a game with the devil. <coughs> so you take them, them through that, then they, those who can evaluate and then the commercial viability and so on, then they are able to come out with a more realistic um, property rate. Mm. And then when you come out with property rate, you are expected to do some certain things. You see, compliance is not exogenous. Compliance is, you, you, you tax me for electricity, that public, when, when you see the tariff, the bill, mm. They are in three layers. But also, in addition to that, you are paying for public light. And we are and very public much. Light, public light, we are told, is for ceremonial streets. Not only. Mm. Not only. Where, where else? Because then we don't have these, these street lights uh, around. No, some places we do have street lights, mm. madam. We do have street lights, but they will never uh, light. Since since before Jesus Christ came, <laughs> the, the street lights have lights, but but then the light the well, lights don't if, if come. You, on. If you could please hold that for me, uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs (IEA) uh, is cautioning government against over reliance on agri uh, as government gets ready for the 2018 budget. Uh, Mr. Dr. Osei Sibe tells TV3 Business News uh, that the move by government to focus heavily on agriculture is unnecessary. Let's listen to. 
uh, his uh, submission and then we'll come back to the studio. Uh, Mr. Edward Karua is already smiling. He will give us a reaction after that. We'll be back shortly. Policy makers have been asked to allocate no less than 10% of the government's annual budget to the agriculture sector. Such a move, they believe, would help increase production in the agri sector by at least 6% annually. Government has subsequently indicated that it will prioritize agriculture and health in the 2018 budget as a measure to grow the economy and create jobs. But the Institute of Economic Affairs says too much investment has already been made into the agri sector this year. If you look at um, the, the uh, planting for food and job creation, you could see that a lot of investments have gone into agricultural production. And this year too, the rains have been quite good. So we're really looking at a very good performance from agri. We shouldn't only focus on agricultural production or the farming processes and increased harvest. I, I don't think that is the way to go. Dr. Sesibe insists luring private sector participation into the agri sector is enough to sustain growth. We need investments, sustainable investments into the area and the private sector are playing a pivotal role in that respect. I think that is what, that is, what is needed now and that will call for government building a very competitive infrastructure along that value chain. Meanwhile, Besemanche, new kind at the third, is also worried lack of proper structures by successive governments to drive growth is a bane of the country's problems. We've had the statistics about other countries which were far below us uh, during the independence era. Uh, but these countries are now way ahead of us in terms of their economic development. And I think uh, we need to really uh, think hard we need to do the proper structuring. You're welcome back. Uh, you, you heard uh, uh, Dr. Ose Sibi of the IE. Uh, Mr. Edward Karwe, what, what's your reaction to what both gentlemen have said? Well, um, I think what I understand him to mean is that uh, you don't uh, over rely on agriculture uh, to the detriment of others. And you see, the, the growth of agriculture is indeed dependent on uh, other uh, sectors, particularly manufacturing. So if you do not look at manufacturing along the line, and they also look at the market, because in this country, it is not necessarily the case that we don't produce enough. You know, it's just that we overproduce. And overproduction, as I indicated earlier on, could be short term. And that is what we've always been hearing. So in order to uh, continue to increase agricultural production, then you have to make sure that when it is whatever is produced is channeled into the market. Mm -hmm. And how would that market be created? It will be created by domestic consumption and then by industrial use. The industrial uh, part of it, which is uh, manufacturing, is not performing well. So you could see that the, over the years, because manufacturing has been declining, eventually agricultural production also follows in its decline. You know, when, if it continues in that direction, manufacturing will come to a negative, agriculture will follow. But when you begin to see manufacturing to go uh, uh, growth up, then you also see agriculture going up. And the two must be together. You see? How, how do you expect the um, planting for food and jobs, uh, the agricultural Marshall Plan, one district, one factory, to be all linked together so that what you are describing is, is practicalized? Well, one of the problems of the agricultural sector is that there are many policies that are running everywhere. Some are duplicating, you know. We need to actually have a Marshall Plan to put them together and then be able to be selective. We can't do everything within the agriculture sector. We can't. We may choose to say that, look, we want to be, to focus on maize production and become an exporter of maize. We may also say that we want to add uh, rice to it because for so many reasons. We are having a growing uh, economy 
the urbanization, uh, middle income uh, uh, population, and given that they will consume more of rice. So if we don't focus on rice production, we have to import to uh, supplement that. And also important will mean that we'll spend more foreign exchange. So we may use these reasons to focus on what? Uh, rice as against others. So we shouldn't also think that we can cover almost everything that uh, is produced in agriculture because we can't be a master of everything in agriculture. Today, Ghana is like... You've mentioned rice and maize. Any other that you, you feel is critical? Yes, it's critical. For instance, Ghana imports so much uh, tomato puree from outside the country. Yet, our own farmers here cry day in, day out. I was listening to TV3 uh, report, and that around Tejma and Tia or whatever, there is a tomato glut already, you know. Yet, when you come to our market, it's all full of what? Imported tomato puree. How are we going to balance that? So it's not just about increasing the production. If you increase the production and you have not put in place, and we are saying that, of course, the one district, one factory, they will say that is the answer. But that will take a long time. It, will, it is going to take some time for the one district, one factory to actually impact seriously on the economy. Because you can't build an industry, uh, a factory over one week or one month or two months. You can't do that. But, but if we have a, a full year's budget coming up, what, what's your expectation? If we have one or two factories, which ones will be those critical uh, factories that should be put up so that, for instance, this tomato glut that we have, it's a shame. It's a shame. Big shame. My, my, my expectation is that, of course, you don't, policies, you need to continue to deal with them. So once the government has focused on agriculture, we would like them to refine the policies. One year of implementation of, say, the planting for food and jobs, they would have come up with some challenges which they need to reform. And then they should, that should be reformed in the agriculture. Now, the one village, one dam concept, which is just, we are told now, it's not necessarily that every village must have a dam, but that uh, water must be made available for farmers. That should also be looked at. And then we we'll see how much of it can be done within the next uh, uh, year. And then so that we can build on it and target ourselves that within the next five years, of course, we should be able to irrigate, say, 10% or our fine lands. Yeah, and those will be the, 10, the critical areas that budget should focus on. Areas. Yeah. Mm. Doc, free SHS is here to stay. We have done one year of implementation for first years. This year we are going into two years. What is your expectation in the budget in, in a few minutes? Um, it's a challenge. Do it for us. It's a challenge to the government. And once the government wants to do it, the government will find money to do it. My problem is still using the old curriculum for these SHS. If you are not careful, we'll be sitting on a, an unemployment time well, bomb. What's, what's your, your challenge with the curriculum? <coughs> if you look at the curriculum, when you come out of SHS, can you be, I mean, a person which you, you can set up your own small thing to work with. Uh, we are just using this English mass and other, uh, but we are not concentrating on the technical and then the vocational aspects where when you come out, you'll be able to. So if at the secondary school level, I couldn't even pay my fees, what about the university? So in the next but, three but, but years... But the, the JHS and SHS <coughs> system is actually supposed to introduce practical studies yeah. Vocational but and are technical they practical studies that are being so is it the curriculum or the way we are we, we, we is deal it the with the curriculum itself and if you look at the secondary schools we have few technical secondary schools are and do sure? they even are you sure yes and <coughs> they are fewer than the the others that do this general thing and how many of them go to them and then see what are the tools and others there and what practical things are they look, doing? Look, I'm asking uh, and, uh, <coughs> continuing questions on this one because we've yeah. had, we have a history in this country where mm -hmm. governments come, they change the curriculum, another government comes and they change the curriculum. And so education is one area that we have uh, used politics to distort a few times. And so 
uh, moving forward, what, what, what is your expectation in the 2018 budget moving forward? Um, already, I felt that government is <coughs> doing something on this curriculum. Thing. Okay, so yeah. curriculum review. <coughs> curriculum review, mm. government is doing it, yes. Um, and then also these dormitories and others, government is also trying to, I mean, uh, put in... I mean, more buildings and others there. So I expect that there will be heavy investment in, in that in area. Yeah, uh, infrastructure. infrastructure in you, you go to some schools and you <coughs> find a lot of bed bats in these schools. So uh, and generally, is, we should deal with these things. And that is not only it. If you look at um, capital expenditure for this year, mm. it has come very low. And if you look at how we've had rains this year, most of the untied rules are damaged. Mm. So the government has to me. repair all, all of these rules. Otherwise, the food and others will remain in the bush. In the bush and it will not come to the city. Exactly. Prof, in, in a minute, please make it very, very brief for me. How do we pluck the loopholes? Because that's for as long as we have leakages, we are not going to get it into the basket. You can't pluck the loopholes in uh, a year. Those are issues. And then when we come to the specifics, I like the way you are trying to get us focused on the key areas. You know, a country where you are managing, you must also be looking at the medium term. We have our vision, and uh, the vision that has come is not what we policy teachers would like to see, unfortunately. But we have medium term plans, and some of our discussion here is not on uh, medium term plans. It's not in short term. It daily should budgets. be on, they belong to medium term, but we are putting them in short term. Curriculum change is not something that we do overnight, and it's rather the number of years, duration, which our political frontliners have been changing. And I want to expect that they shouldn't change the number of years for senior high schools. They it's enough. The they should focus on availability of books. They should focus on supervision. They should make sure that other logistics that support teaching are there. We have a lot of technical schools. Mm. And I tell you, most of them do not have what it takes to teach to the technical train. subjects. Yes. It does, they don't have it. Maybe I have multiple areas of experience. I'm into construction economics, what you call in Ghana civil engineering, and I know what is there. I still teach project management at mm. University Prof, of Ghana. Round it up for me. So what I'm trying to say is that some of the things are there. We have a wonderful system, educational system, but we don't have what, what it, it would take to deliver, deliver a good top flyer. We are very mediocre in our... So, Prof, in the 2018 budget, you're expecting some, some changes in, in that area. I want to see them in the medium-term plan. Mm. And I want us to start discussing so that we do a three-tier discussion rather than just budget, budget, budget. budget. Oh, okay. Let's see what medium-term we have which the budget is annualizing. Prof, we have to go. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, uh, Professor Kletos Dodono. We had Mr. Uh, Dr. Magnus Ebo Duncan and Mr. Edward Kariwe. Thank you so much uh, for being part of this discussion. Thanks to the production team. Uh, we are expecting the budget on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday the 15th, uh, November 2018. And they have mentioned some of the highlights. My name is Deborah Kwabla. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. God willing, same time next week, we'll be here. And have a productive week this week. Bye.